integrated lives influence LGBTQ <coughs> Filipino Filipina activism in Canada? How might LGBTQ experiences with oppression link up with the experience of other marginalized communities? Participants in this panel will center on the experiences working with LGBTQ Filipinos to resist their marginalization within Canada as they exhibit multiple forms of resiliency in the process. Our first speaker is Ken Santos. He is the Secretary General of Ugnayan Ang Kabatang Pilipino sa Canada, Filipino-Canadian Youth Alliance of, Can of Ontario, a progressive Filipino-Canadian youth and student organization that is committed to educating, organizing, and mobilizing Filipino-Canadian youth and the community for the just and genuine settlement and integration of Filipinos in Canadian society. He has been organizing with UKPC Ontario and the Makaisa Center since 2009. He graduated from York University with an honors BA in political science, French studies, and a bachelor of education in 2012. He works as a teacher, as a, as a French teacher, actually. Um, please welcome uh, Ken Santos. I'm actually co-presenting with uh, Joy Siogson, so. Um, I'll also introduce Joy. Um, uh, Joy is a founding member of the chair of the Philippine Women's Center of Ontario. She has a BA degree in women's studies and psychology from Simon Fraser University. She started organizing with the Philippine Women's Center of BC in January 1999 as a volunteer for the first ever Philippine Canadian Women's Consultative Forum under the theme of Towards Filipino Women's Liberation. It was through this event that she started her involvement and commitment herself in being part of a movement that advances genuine women's liberation and empowerment. Please welcome Joy. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting the Makaisa Center to this event, uh, Diasporic Intimacies, Queer Filipinos, Filipinas, and Canadian Imaginaries. I would like to thank the organizers of this event, Dr. Robert Diaz, Mr. Carlo Azores, and Mr. Fritz Pino, and of course, Ms. Marissa Largo, a longtime ally of the Makaisa Center, and um, uh, an educator and artist that, you know, truly inspiring. So kudos to each and every one of you. Um, as, as Marissa said, we also catered for this event, so I hope you enjoyed the lunch. So the title of our presentation is Past Gains and New Beginnings, Organizing LGBTQ at the Makaisa Center. Um, I will share my personal stories about my life being queer here in Toronto, my own insights, as well as my own involvement as a community activist and organizer at the Makaisa Center. Afterwards, Joy and I will also expand on our organizing work by presenting the Congress of Progressive Filipino Canadians Declaration and 15 Concerns. We will also talk about a recent conference we hosted in Vancouver called Strength, Struggles, and Stories, Filipino Canadian LGBTQ National Consultative Forum. It was the first ever national consultative forum on Filipino Canadian LGBTQ. All right, so I have a PowerPoint presentation, so I'm gonna head over there. includes the Filipino-Canadian Youth Alliance of Ontario, the Philippine Women's Center of Ontario, and CICLAB, which is a Filipino-Canadian workers organization. What do we do? We educate, organize, and mobilize the Filipino-Canadian community for our just and genuine settlement and integration in Canada along socialist lines. How do we organize? Through our community-based conferences, lectures, workshops, art exhibits, cultural concerts, and community-based research. So these are just like some events that we held for the past years and so. One of our events was Making the Youth Count in Canada's Future, The Struggle of Young Workers in the Age of Austerity and Neoliberal Globalization. It was held here in Toronto. 
And this is another conference, Worker Struggles Amidst Neoliberal Globalization, held in Toronto again. And this was in Vancouver, which was a, con a conference called, called Counterspin. We use art in our community-based uh, activism. We um, document our community's lived experiences, turn them to art, and use them as our own resources to educate our, the broader community about the struggles and issues we face as a community. And this was a recent art exhibit that we held here in Toronto called Our Voices, a portrait series. Again, it was a community-based art exhibit that captured the day-to-day -day lived experiences and struggles of the Filipino Canadian community. These are examples of the art. Actually, one of the art pieces from this event is uh, displayed at the um, art exhibit, uh, which will open tonight. So, yeah, that's really exciting. And we do campus organizing at the University of Toronto and York University. We hold workshops on anti-racism, understanding uh, our current situation as a community in Canada, as well as workshops on feminism and um, working class issues. We also hold cult cultural concerts that has Roots, Rhymes, and Resistance, which start started in Vancouver almost two decades ago. Um, this was held in 2012. It was, it was called Laying Tracks Against Cutbacks. It was a time when the cutbacks and the privatization of a lot of the public services was really, uh, really intensified under the Ford administration. So we use arts and culture to really talk about and educate our community. This was held at the University of Toronto. And this um, forum was held in Vancouver on November 24 and 25th. It was called Strength, Struggle, Stories, LGBTQ National Consultative Forum. Robert Diaz, Dr. Robert Diaz was actually one of the presenters and speakers of the event. And yeah, so, all right. So that's what we do as an organization, just provides a brief, brief background. So right now, just allow me to take, sorry. <laughs> How's everyone doing? <laughs> everyone looks so tense. Okay, anyway, all right, so allow me to take the conference uh, titled Diasporic Intimacies, literally, and get intimate with everyone here. Let me share some experiences that I would say provide a glimpse of my own frustrations and struggles as a queer person here in Toronto. So, so I'm going to share three incidents. About five summers ago, I remember walking down on Winona Street to attend a 1 p.m. meeting at the center. I remember a car following me, stopping intermittently, until the driver, a white man who was about 50, 55 years old, talked to me and asked if I'd like to go for a ride. So, and I said, no, of course. Being 22 and 10 pounds lighter at the time, I would get hit on a lot of clubs and message online. <laughs> So a car stopping by did not really shock me. But what shocked and bothered me, though, was the audacity of that man to even ask that in the first place. Uh, where did he get the confidence, right? Like, we need to examine these experiences all the time. Although the incident could appear um, funny and simplistic, it is also very problematic as it reveals dynamics of racial and class inequities. It reveals racism and white supremacy the exotization and objectification of racialized queer bodies and the privilege which gives license to these people to say and do as please. Am I making too much of the situation? I don't think so. When Southeast Asian countries like the Philippines and Thailand are turned into the brothels of the world and thousands of gay Asian men um, live off the sex trade, it is not a surprise that these global structural dynamics eventually shape and orient a racist anti-Asian queer consciousness in the global north. We Filipinos are also very Catholic. Uh, just recently, the Pope visited the Philippines, virtually shutting down the capital city of Manila with the president declaring a five-day national holiday during the pontiff visit. Catholicism has permeated all aspects of Filipino culture. 
beginning from Spanish colonization onwards. Perhaps given the church official stance on gay marriage and views on homosexuality, a lot of Filipinos have very unaccepting and outdated views on LGBTQs. I was actually witness to this situation when three years ago I bought a cake for a friend at Metro. The worker was an older Filipina tita. I politely asked her and greeted her and asked for a raspberry swill cake, basically, in a very endearing way, like very bakla, like, hi tita, like, you know, could I please um, have that cake? Her response, he, she said, kayong mga bakla, mapupunta kayong lahat sa impyerno, makasalanan kayo. Translation, you gay guys will all go to hell. You're all sinners. So of course, given my personality, I re retaliated right away. Well, I am hell personified, so call your manager right now. So <laughs> it's pretty good. I got a free gift card and also a free cake. So I mean, it worked out well in the end. <laughs> so, but in retrospect, thinking back, I think that she would have never treated me that way if I were non-Filipino. So I mean, decolonization work, really, we also have to engage in that within our own community. And another experience, in my fourth year of university studies, I took a political science course called Marxism, Feminism, and Poststructuralism. In one session, we read chapters from Rosemary Hennessy's Profit and Pleasure, Sexual Identities, and Late Capitalism. As we were discussing the readings, debates eventually ensued, given some of the men's understandings of the reading. It was quite an interesting class since York University is well known for its left orientation. Uh, the room teams of anarchists, Marxists, feminists, post-structuralists, post-colonialists, and brochalists, and so on. So I had an altercation with some of the left identified men in the course. One said we should focus all our attention to the class struggle, and one me, uh, and one man made me lose it when he said, well, it's your choice to be gay, right? So I just hold at the man and told them, well, you're being oppressive right now. Let's call it for what it is. It's patriarchy in action. So yeah, I mean, like, all those experiences provide a glimpse of, I think, the quotidian, and the everyday struggles that queer of color face. And if you have a, maybe a slight bit of consciousness, you catch them right away, right? And you call them for what they are. Five minutes? Seriously? Well, I'm almost done. Um, actually, our presentation are integrated, so, yeah. So, okay. <laughs> I, I talk too much. I get five. <laughs> okay, okay. So, on top of these everyday incidents that capture the struggles of being queer, I'm also a son of a live-in caregiver. <clears throat> to date, more than 100,000 Filipino women came to Canada under the live-in caregiver program, now called Canada's caregiver program. We're also Canada's largest source of um, temporary foreign workers. These labor programs have extensively defined the character of our community. Through Canada's temporary labor schemes, a lot of transnational workers are denied permanence, genuine settlement, and integration in Canadian society. I was gonna show a video of myself when I first got involved, but I only have five minutes. So I will show <laughs> a video of uh, one of the participants and member of the center. Um, just one sec, okay? It's very, very important for us to document and um, to validate these experiences. Um, yeah, so we can move our struggles forward. So I'm just gonna go quickly. So in my sixth year and, and uh, yeah, so the short documentary film explores explored issues of de-skilling, non-accreditation of previous, previous educational attainment, and economic marginalization. So in my six year and ongoing involvement, I realized that the queer Filipino struggle has always gone beyond the issue of identity. Through organizing, we meet community members whose primary struggles are not necessarily because of them being gay or queer. We have had members who were living caregivers and identified as lesbians and their concerns were getting their papers and being economically stable. So um, anyway, all of these make me ask the following questions. So what's our role as LGBTQ? Like, where do we LGBTQ Filipino Canadians fit within the larger queer community? Where do we fit in terms of the queer movement, if there is one? And how do we advance our struggles as queer people of color within a queer community that is racist and classist? The current dominant culture in queer communities is that of neoliberalism, evidently seen in the commercialization of queer identity through pride, 
etc. And at times, the only way to be more queer is by exhibiting your own purchasing power. We have to be cognizant that this cuts down on low-income folks, especially people of color. On the other, I ask, what is the LGBTQ role in the Filipino-Canadian community to advance our struggles from within? We are dealing with a community that is conservative, homophobic, and transphobic, steeped in patriarchal values that polices our sexualities. We may feel, though, at, at times that we are differently accepted as long as we perform roles that are palatable to the community, such as being turned into figures of entertainment or performing work roles that are highly bakla. Moreover, what is our role within the left movement? Much of the left, or what's left of it at this point in time, has a lot of learning and unlearning to do when it comes to community and movement building that truly encompasses the struggles around sexuality, class, race, and gender, and other markers of oppression and difference. And lastly, what is our role as Filipinos, in LGBTQ, in the advancement of our community's overall struggles for a just and genuine settlement and integration? As progressive, we cannot accept the tra that transnational workers remain permanently impermanent. How do we break this cycle of permanent impermanence within our community? So just to end, I have always viewed my activism and community organizing work as an expression of my own queerness. I believe that we cannot tackle the queer struggle without taking into consideration the class struggle, the woman's struggle, anti-racist struggles, and First Nation struggles. We have to simultaneously tackle and address all these issues so we can move all of them forward. How do we concretize this? For me, it's about continuing my organizing work, building that progressive culture within my organization and the broader community, and organizing more community members and forging political unity so we can collectively move our work forward. Thanks. Um, so, um, good afternoon for, for inviting us actually to present here. I'd like to also, I can't see, I have to wear my glasses. <laughs> I'm like, everybody's a blur. Um, but I actually want to congratulate all of the organizers. Um, for this um, event, and again, thank you for inviting us. Um, I know we've been waiting for this uh, for quite some time. We've had several meetings about this this event, so congratulations, it's a good turnout. Um, so I'm just gonna share, I know um, we're kind of running out of time, but I'm gonna share very briefly the work uh, that we do at the Philippine Women's Center. Um, so as Ken mentioned, actually, we at the Makaisa Center have always looked at queer struggles um, as integral and, integ and integrated within our own organizing work. So uh, the Philippine Women's Center of BC, for example, uh, was founded 25 years ago, was built and sustained by a lot of lesbian identified women who worked, led, and worked alongside other women, the youth and workers to empower and move our community struggles forward. Lesbian women were also fundamental in the building of the Philippine Women's Center of Ontario, which is going into its 15th year um, this coming October. Um, since then, we have actually been organizing our community, most especially our women, uh, to fight for our empowerment and liberation. And I actually um, would like to acknowledge the presence of some of the women here who helped uh, form uh, the Philippine Women's Center. Uh, they were, actually they were here earlier. I saw them over um, at lunch, but I guess they all have to leave um, for work. Um, but um, anyway, so it was at this, um, in, in May 2010, I'm just gonna sort of like push it forward. In May 2010, uh, progressive Filipino Canadians came together in Montreal at a um, national conference called um, Counterspin, creating and nurturing a new path for the progressive Filipino Canadian community. It was at this conference where we solidified our political work along the lines of advancing our struggles towards the Filipino Canadian community's just and genuine settlement and integration in Canadian society. Um, so this conference actually um, forged the formation of the Congress of Progressive Filipino Canadians, or C CPFC, that now serves as the National Center of Progressive Organizations, um, such as the National Alliance of Philippine Women in Canada, Sick Club Canada, and the Filipino Canadian Youth Alliance. Um, so an important outcome of, of this conference was the commitment of CPFC and its member organizations to address and deepen our understanding of the various issues that affect Filipino Canadian community, other transnational communities, and the bro broader Canadian society. 
Um, so in our efforts to move forward our community struggles um, for a just and genuine settlement integration along socialist lines, we continue to actually deepen our understanding of Canada as an imperialist, capitalist, and white uh, settler colonial state. Um, so, like having said that, we actually, during this conference in 2010, we came up with um, 15 concerns. And one of the concerns actually that, um, one of the concerns that we have um, is actually the concern on LGBTQ. Um, and it is um, the upholding the rights of LGBT against violence, abuse, and other forms of discrimination to a life of dignity and secured existence. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, I'm doing so the concern on, on LGBTQ came from the reality that Filipino-Canadian LGBTQs continue to face homophobia, transphobia, racism, and discrimination within and outside of our community. Um, so in order to begin the work on this concern, we have been talking about it for, for a very long time. Um, but in order to begin um, the work on this concern, just on November 24 and 25th, uh, the Philippine Women's Center of BC actually hosted the, the first ever Filipino-Canadian um, LGBTQ National Consultative Forum. Um, actually, Robert uh, Diaz was one of the, the speakers at that consultation, and he shared with us um, his preliminary research findings on trans-Filipino women. We also invited um, Angela Cameron, a law professor at the University of Ottawa, to speak about uh, current LGBT struggles within the Ontario education system and other issues. Um, so during this time, there were also some members of the community um, who shared their experiences of, of being queer and some of the struggles that they face. Um, you know, and we held a consultation, especially for the youth and, and the young people, to have that venue for us really um, share um, our experiences and the struggles that we face as, as members of the queer um, community. Um, so Ashley, one of the, the speakers, Ashley de la Cruz Yip, was, um, shared her own personal experiences and the struggles as a young queer Filipina woman who happens to be in the athletics, um, in basketball, I think, in, 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 in the university, and also like the struggles that she faced coming out um, and the continuing struggle, um, especially um, in, the, um, in, in being an athlete and being a young um, um, Filipina. So the overall goal of the conference was to actually have an initial um, discussion and documentation of the experiences of LGBTQ in our community and to also come up with an action plan or a plan of action. So we held a workshop and drafted um, five, actually five um, plan of actions. Uh, so I just want to share it with you. I know I, I don't really have a lot of time, but one is to connect and build networks with other LGBTQ, LGBTQ of color and people of color organizations. Um, we'd like to document and historicize the experiences of LGBTQ Filipinos, Filipinas in Canada. We know that there's a long history there, especially within our community. Um, but I think what's lacking is that uh, we have not really, um, you know, like document. There is really um, not enough documentation in terms of um, uh, the experiences of, of LGBTQ um, in, within the Filipino community. Um, third is to acknowledge and critique the societal, political, and economic factors that affect LB LGBTQ Filipinos, Filipinas in Canada. Four is to create and foster spaces of dialogue, participation, and involvement um, for LGBTQ and their, and their allies. And lastly is to advocate for the diverse LGBTQ Filipinos, Filipinas concerns in all aspects of Canadian society, including legal, social, political, economic, and cultural. So our hope actually with, um, you know, having the first consultation, our hope is to be able to bring that consultation here in Toronto and also um, in other parts of Canada so that we can really, um, you know, like provide that venue um, for, for, you know, LGBTQ um, Filipinos and Filipinas to actually, you know, like have um, a gathering to share our experiences and struggles so that we can... Um, you know, like we can move forward in terms of, of, of um, organizing um, queer people in, in, in our community. So thank you, and um, yeah, like we can continue the discussion maybe during the q and I don't wanna go too long. And Weston Mount Dennis. 
Benjamin holds an honors Bachelor of Arts at U of T, from U of T and was the president of the Filipino Students Association of Toronto at the U of T from 2007 to 2009. Please welcome Ben. Hi. Hello? Hello? Okay. Is it working? Okay, great. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Ben, and I hope to give you a glimpse today about the work that I do at the 519. But first, I just want to share with you my story of how I started to become involved in the field of LGBTQ community development. In high school and in elementary school, I was called names, and I was harassed. People harassed me for being queer. People harassed me for being Filipino. This, however, didn't really affect me because I was at the point where I became indifferent. I didn't care anymore. The homophobia, the racism, none of that really mattered. So something really happens to you inside when you really struggle to survive you really stop believing that a better world is possible. And you stop believing that the slogans that they teach you in schools about how it gets better are true. So when I was in university, um, it was my first year, and I joined the Filipino Students Association of Toronto. I was very insecure with myself, my identity as a Filipino, and as a young person who recently came out of the closet. And I thought I was bisexual, I was crazy. Like, I'm like, so gay, sorry. Um, <laughs> anyways. When I was, yeah, so, um, when I was at the Filipino Students Association, I met a person who would eventually become my longtime friend and mentor. She was the president at the time and was very secure and open with her sexual orientation. From this experience, I was able to be a part of Filipino Awareness Week events, volunteer and support newcomer children at youth, at the Filipino Center Toronto and became more involved in school than I ever thought I would be. Because our leader was queer, I was able to see a lot of myself in her. And that gave me the confidence to be open about my own sexual orientation, which eventually helped me transition into my gender queer identity. This experience taught me about how having a positive mentor and role model can contribute to an individual's growth and well-being. When I look back on this experience, I am truly grateful and I am always so willing to defer to the leadership of young people because it was through seeing other people who looked like me and who shared the same experiences as me that gave me the confidence to really see the kind of world that I wanted to create. And having lived this experience instilled with me a deeper responsibility to create a world that I wanted other people to live in. So after university, I became a youth case management lead at a for youth by youth organization called For Youth Initiative. And eventually, I became what I am today, um, the Newcomer Families Settlement Services Coordinator at the 519. So in this role, I work a lot with newcomer youth, caregivers, and lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, and queer refugees, where the basis of their refugee claims are based on gender identity and sexual orientation. The 519 is a multi-service organization that has a special focus to support the downtown core community and has a broader mandate to support the larger LGBTQ community across the country and around the world. So what guides my work and the work of my colleagues at the 519 are the values of self-determination and resilience. We believe that people are their own experts and we give them the knowledge and skill sets to help them have control over decisions and outcomes in their lives. And through our programs and services, we help them stay strong and supported throughout their journey. I'd like to share you the story of someone whose name has been changed to John. He was separated from his mother for six years. He was a young queer-identified Filipino youth that I met. John was 18 years old when he first came to Canada. Initially, he didn't want to come to Canada because he was comfortable living with his aunts, uncles, and grandparents in the Philippines. At the same time, he wanted to see what life would, like, would be with his mother. At the beginning, he was excited to be in Canada, but after a while, he had a difficult time with his parents and felt very isolated in his first two years here. When I met him, he expressed that he faced challenges with communication at home and school and faced financial pressures that included the stress to support his family both here and in the Philippines. So the stress of immigration, the separation from his extended family, and going through the transitional period of adolescence 
was all on top of his challenges in navigating the LGBTQ community in Toronto. So then he joined the Newcomer Youth Engagement Advisory Committee at our center. This, this committee gave him an opportunity to be a part of every step of our program development process and ensure that our programs reflected the needs and interests that he and his peers faced. Eventually, we developed the Student Newcomer Access Program, a fun and interactive way for newcomer youth to learn about leadership, community building, and think critically about lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, and queer accessibility. To further support our clients, we offer academic, mental health, and recreation programming. Additional programs that we have created, and created by the support of our LGBTQ refugees, is Breakthrough, um, a newcomer network where the focus is breaking down social isolation and helping LGBTQ newcomers expand their social and professional networks, which is actually coordinated by my coworker, Padmini. <laughs> and we also have the Emerge LGBTQ Mentorship Program, which matches LGBTQ newcomers with peer mentors who support them in navigating community resources, the LGBTQ community, and helps them create a safe sense of belonging. So the challenge of access is something that is an ongoing issue as well as immigration status as a barrier. Our clients experience stigma attached to being a refugee claimant, having access to inclusive housing, healthcare, mental health services, and appropriate safer spaces as well as employment opportunities. To help mitigate these challenges, we've created different referral systems to community resources, and we offer a full suite of LGBTQ supports that focus on food security, mental health, seniors, family programs, trans programs, and trans youth programs. The LGBTQ experience extends well beyond the village itself. In 2014, our education and training department introduced Toronto employers to our workplace inclusion curriculum, providing the tools, training, and insight to become more inclusive for LGBTQ employees. Our sports and recreation program spoke out for more inclusive spaces in the field and in the locker room, where many within the LGBTQ community continue to feel marginalized, excluded, and unsafe. As a queer Filipino community advocate, I will always strive to create a space where communities can come together and make things better. That is the foundation on which my career was built upon and a mandate that makes me optimistic for my future. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Jay and I work at a college. So my question is for the 519. Um, I work with students and um, I want to know what type of youth services you have for trans um, and as well as the other LGBT, LGBT community um, in terms of do you offer counseling and other stuff like that. So um, there are many youth programs that we offer. Um, over 200 different LGBTQ community groups run programs at the 519 and our space is free for any organization um, to use our space. So um, just off the top of my head, we have programs that are run by our co coordinators. So that is one program called Trans Youth Toronto that focuses on one-on-one um, -on -one support, group programs, and food security. I run the uh, Newcomer Youth Engagement Program, so that is youth specific. But my programs are mainly off-site, so I do a lot of my work in um, neighborhoods like Western Mount Dennis, Lawrence Heights, Jane and Finch. And through my work in those different areas, I work with a lot of queer Filipino youth that don't necessarily want to go to programming within the vicinity of Church and Wellesley. So um, we have a lot of programs and services, and if, you can always contact me directly um, so I can help connect you to, their, to our programs. But um, yeah, so literally 200 community groups come to our space every year. In terms of personal counseling, like one-to-one, -one, do yeah. you have that type of services too? Uh, we do. We have a counseling support um, service. Specifically for you? Uh, not specifically for you. So for anyone who has experienced um, homophobia, violence, harassment, but we do support youth as well in our program. About So just to give you a figure, we have maybe... 1,124 participants in our counseling program and about maybe 75% of them are under the age of 29. So a vast majority of our clients are youth. And do you have like a waiting time for them to be? Um, it's really specific, but if you contact our counseling coordinator, the turnaround time would be about 24 hours for you to get a phone call. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Great. That's very good. 
I, yeah. Thank Mar you. Thank you. <laughs> Marissa, I just have one thing. Thanks. I want to add one thing, actually. Um, but this is for Makaisa Center. Um, first, I wanted to thank um, all of you for participating. But I, I wanted to ask a question because I think it's an exciting moment that we are all here together and we're all sharing kind of our experiences, but also our political work. And I wanted to really ask, you know, you are going to be featured in the gallery that we have later tonight. And I wanted to ask what we can do, right, to kind of really break the boundaries of like academia, political work, and art. And I think like that's something that has you, have you always seen your organization as an important kind of vessel for doing that? Because I am aware that you know, you've done a lot of art um, practice, you've done a lot of art production, and, and I wanted to really kind of highlight that by asking a question about, do you see this as a possibility, right? That we can kind of break these boundaries and really expand on these particular kind of links right, between the academic world, the activist world, the political world, um, the types of questions you're asking. Thanks. For me, of course, academic collaboration are very important, but it's only, we don't, the thing about us, like as activists, we always center people's lived experiences, right? And um, it's only an aspect of organizing work. It doesn't take a central key in our organizing work. I'm sorry to the activists in the room, but no, <laughs> it does not. We don't look at it that way. And in terms of collaboration, it has to be equal, it has to be mutual respect and mutual understanding. And also, who is the academic doing the work, right? I mean, we do not want our work to be appropriated. We want our work to be presented in ways that we want it to be presented, right? We want it to be anti-racist. Anti we want it to be decolonized. We want it to reflect the interests of the working class because that's the tenet of our organization. So for us, if those um, um, conditions are not met, sorry, we will write our own research and we will move forward with our work because there has to be grounds. Um, these are people's lived experiences and we're talking about the working class struggle here. Right, so that's just, yeah, that's, that's my take on it. I'm not sure. I have no comment. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, of course, it's always... Uh, like for us, it's always uh, there's always that possibility, um, but I agree with Ken because um, you know I mean we've had a lot of um, what do you call this meetings um, with academics and you know and and we've worked with a lot of academics also, uh, but what's very important for us because um, as what Ken mentioned, these are actually the art pieces that 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 we create are actually coming from you know like people's like real experiences. These are their their day to day experiences. Um, our last exhibit, for example, it's called Our Voices, and um, so there were four four groups actually, or four main art pieces, and and these are actually from you know interviews that we've done or focus groups that we've done. Um, so like we were very, you know what I mean? Like like we have like we always look at okay, like how is this gonna be? How are our communities' experiences? going to be represented when we engage in this collaborative work? Is it, you know, is, is it truly collaborative, right? Like, are we, you know, are, are members of our community um, gaining something out of this? And I think that's, that's what's really important for us when we, when we look at, um, you know, collaborative work with, with academia or, or with, with anyone else outside of, of, of our um, community. Thank you. Just you know, as we move forward, it's good. We're having continued question and discussion, and I think they we're building blocks right, to kind of thinking through real collaborative work. So thank you. Thank you for sharing.